Hello everyone and welcome to the Squash TV Plus documentary. So if you've come straight from the Squash TV YouTube channel, you'll have an idea of what this documentary is about. But if you've stumbled in here by accident, then welcome. And this is where I'll be giving you guys a unique insight into the world of Squash TV and how the Professional Squash Association actually deals with their live events from a broadcasting perspective. So from the trailer, my name's Tom Kirby and I'm part of the Squash TV production crew. So my job is to help set up the cameras and operate some of their broadcasting equipment during their live events. And for this particular documentary, I'll be focusing on the Squash Denon tournament in France back in September 2018. And as I mentioned previously, this is more of a personal project of mine as opposed to a PSA affiliated production. So I'll cover aspects such as camera operations, glass court features, side court features, and how we actually broadcast the event. Don't worry, it's a lot more interesting than it sounds. So where further to begin this documentary than on a cold Saturday morning on our way to Manchester airport so that we can fly to Nantes in France. So our first objective when we landed was to go straight to the hotel and drop our stuff off. And this hotel was actually pretty nice. It was the same hotel as most of the other squash players stayed at. But we couldn't stay long because we had a busy day ahead of us with our second objective, which was to travel to the side courts and set up the streaming equipment where the first round matches of the event were being held. Before setting up the side courts, however, we needed to go to the Opera Theatre first because that's where the glass court was being built and we needed to make sure that all the broadcasting equipment got there safely. Um, and this is the first PSA event I've been to, so I had nothing to compare it to. But I mean, the location of this event and what the Opera Theatre looked like inside was just absolutely incredible. So after that little pit stop, we needed to go to the other club where the side courts were being streamed. And this club was like a warehouse converted into a squash club, but the setup was actually really cool there. So the first task here was to set up the camera equipment and figure out how the cables would get from the camera to the 4G streaming equipment. Um, we eventually clamped the cameras onto uh, anything that was stable enough, so we, we looked at some wood there that was part of the structure of the bar. We clamped the cameras onto there. And for the cables, this is where the difficulty came in because we had to kind of cable it across the top of a roof so that people below the players, bystanders, wouldn't trip up on the cables or stamp on it and disrupt the feed. Um, so I had to go up to the roof of the bar uh, to make sure that the cables could be put away neatly and wouldn't distract anyone. And it was a bit of a hassle to rig the cables across the roof. But if that's what you've got to do to produce the best quality content, then that's what you've got to do. Um, and although the roof looked quite fragile, it was basically just one solid sheet of metal. 
So, you know, there's no way of you falling through it. And it was perfectly safe as long as you're careful and aware of your surroundings and where you're stepping. Um, however, my director thought it wouldn't be a good idea for us both to be up there, just so we didn't put too much stress on the roof. So he stayed on a ladder beside the bar and guided me on where to rig the cables. And I was like, okie dokie, that sounds like a good plan. But anyway, after this, we celebrated our first day of tour with a pint at a local bar near our hotel. And there was some really funky live music going on. And I just took out my camera, started filming it. I was absolutely loving it. And this band was actually really good. I started to forget about the tiredness, the hunger, because I was with the crew, we had some beers, we had the live music playing in the background, and it was just a, a pretty special way of ending my first day on tour. So this is it, the first day of the tournament. I was so excited to get started and I was just excited to see what it was like to be running a PSA event. Um, so the first place we went to again was the side courts because this is where the um, first rounds were being held. And all we needed to do was, once we got there, make sure all the streaming equipment was still working. Um, and after that, we were all good to go and get started. So while the matches are going on, we usually stay quite close to the streaming equipment in case something goes wrong with the feed and we can fix it more easily. Um, apart from that, that's pretty much it of the side courts. So typically with side courts, the streaming quality can dip up and down a little bit because it's a lot more Wi-Fi dependent compared to the streaming you'll be receiving from the glass courts, which we usually have a much more reliable network for. So while the side courts were going on, we then had to travel to the Opera Theatre to set up the glass courts. And we had a similar problem with the cabling, um, but this time, instead of going on the roof, um, we had a problem in which we couldn't get the cables through the fire exit, which separated the main stage where the glass court was from where the squash TV equipment was situated. Um, so eventually, we had to kind of just drill a hole by the side of the door so that we could get all the cables from our um, studio and from our kind of squash TV base to the main stage and connect the cameras to the broadcasting equipment. Um, a bit unconventional, but it worked eventually. So once we did that, we then had to connect the cables to the cameras. And it's important for the cabling to be neat 
because we don't want it to be distracting for the viewers at home and it also avoids any trip hazards for the players and staff as they walk onto the stage. So for a typical camera setup, we usually have three cameras from the front, um, a camera from the front left, a camera from the front right, and an over the head camera at the top in the middle of the court. Um, this over the head camera is usually used for lets and stroke decisions for the referee, um, but it, it can also be used for like live replay if it shows the best angle of the shot. And then we also have two cameras from the back, uh, one on the back left. And for this tournament, we had a unique looking back right camera, which um, displayed a, I guess, unique perspective on the court with that high angle um, back right, I guess, feel. And this new perspective was greatly appreciated by our commentators, Jerry and Parky. Backhand drop from the back of the court and that flick. Just uh, jaw dropping squash from Wilshrop. Wow, that's a great pickup. Well, this angle really does show the speed of the game for me. I like being on court with the guys. Oh, thought he was teeing himself up for the nick attempt. I've seen him slow down, Dad. Have you, Simon? No, it's, uh, it's quite impressive really to keep this pace up against someone of Wilstrop's level. This is great work. He's, oh, he's got Wilstrop everywhere, hasn't he? Yeah, he's getting tired. Who is Wilstrop and you? Oh. Typical Wilstrop. This is the stubborn side of this Yorkshireman. So these are the cameras that surround the court. Then we have cameras that surround the audience looking into the court. Um, so for this, we usually have two different types. We have the normal uh, back angle that looks down on the court like a full frame shot from the audience's perspective. Um, then we have a beauty shot. And for this particular event, the beauty shot was like a high angle shot with the audience to the left, the opera singer in the middle, and the glass court to the right. But this beauty shot changes dramatically from event to event because it's essentially the wow shot of the tournament. And obviously the wow shot can be anywhere. It depends on the location, you know, it doesn't have to be a high angle shot, it can be a low angle shot, it can be something from the ground, something from the air. It's just something that is eye-catching to the audience and we usually cut to it at the end of the game or the end of the match to keep the audience visually entertained. The number one seed based at Colwyn Bay in North Wales. Second outing against Aiken. So to get the cables to the back cameras we basically had to rig it up the side of the theatre um, around the DJ booth and along the ground of the second stand until the cables reach the cameras. The main back shot of the glass court comes from two different perspectives. So you have the shot of the entire stage, which includes the glass court and some of the side bits from around the glass court. And then you just have a close-up shot of just the glass court. Um, so to do this, we simply used two different cameras with different zooming measurements. Uh, even though they were slightly different angles at the back, because of how far back they were from the glass court, you would never notice the difference in angle because one camera was here, the other one was here. But when you cut from one to the other, it looked like they came from the same camera, but just slightly zoomed in. Um, and that's, I guess, the further back you are from the glass court, the easier it is to be able to transition from one camera to the other because obviously you've got that distance to, to compensate for the angle change. Now that we have the glass court rigging set up, we can finally start the main matches at the venue and let the tournament officially start broadcasting.
but before the tournament started, we were treated with a unique live performance to kick it all off. So they had this amazing opera singer accompanied by some live music as well as a performance on the glass court which was like a rally but without squash ball so there was like lunging, diving and it was all really neat and rehearsed. And then they had a projector which projected silhouettes of the squash players on a screen in front of the glass court with like cool lighting effects around the glass court. I mean it was, it felt like a, a play in, in, in a theatrical performance funny enough being in the opera theatre. Um, but things got really crazy at the end when the lights started flashing and everything was mental. I was just in amazement about all the production and how much work they put in it. I was absolutely loving it. And most importantly, so did the audience. And after this performance, the match is then started. Oh, this is an unbelievable rally. This is fantastic, this race. Oh, oh lovely what finish. a wonderful lovely rally. Finish. <laughs> Enjoyed that one, Parky. That was very physical. I still don't believe you were in Verona. <laughs> let alone saw the opera. Oh, he's dived. It's a true story. He's done again. Oh, he's done word. it. That's two. He wanted to dive and he's won the rally. Gregoire Marsh, who's got the crowd, the mojo's going. That is the biggest roar we've heard. Quite fitting, really, from the defending champion. Check out that for athleticism. Just loves it here in Nantes, doesn't he? Such a performer here. Well, it's just ridiculous. I mean, there you go. The gymnast. The acrobat. Amazing. Look at it. Look at the way he gets back up. <laughs> no, there's no point in arguing, August. You're not going to get any uh, respite there. Even Ralph was clapping that rally. So the basic setup of broadcasting is that we have the director on one side of the table, the free play operator in the middle, and the video referee assistant on the other side. I'll explain what the free play operator's role is in a minute, but the director's role is kind of a combination of lots of different jobs, including being a vision mixer and a sound mixer. I'll explain what those roles are to as well in the future. So this is an example of the vision mixing desk we use at Squash TV, which is brought in by an external production company. I won't go into too much detail about how it works, but basically you have an array of buttons in the cross point area, which correspond to a specific camera feed. Um, the green button means that it's in the queue for the director to assess whether they like it or not. And the red button means that the camera feed is now live. There are also other buttons on the desk with a variety of functions like the fader, that allows the vision mixer to manually adjust the transition dissolve fade from one camera to another. Um, you can also create a preset on this. So for example, you can make a four second dissolve, um, save that to a memory and then assign one of the buttons in the cross fade area to match that setting. So when you press the button on the cross, uh, cross point area, uh, the vision mixing desk will automatically make that transition without you having to worry about um, the fader and doing that at the right pace and speed. 
which can save a lot of time and effort, especially when vision mixing live, it can be quite stressful. So having the ability to just press a button and do it automatically can, can save a lot of effort. So that's what the vision mixer does. The director may also be responsible for the sound mixing as well, which is essentially making sure or adjusting the levels of the audio from the commentators and from the court to make sure that the audio doesn't clip or distort because it will be peaking too high and this can create a very muffled and generally distorted sound which isn't really ideal or makes a pleasant listening experience. So that's pretty much what the director does and then you have the free play operator who is responsible for all the live replays in a match um, and the actual I guess um, layout of the free play machine compared to the vision mixing desk is actually very similar if just from the face value of it but instead of having an array of buttons corresponding to a specific camera feed you have what's called an output button um, which when pressed um, gives you a short clip of that match as soon as you pressed it for about like you know four or five seconds um, this clip is then exported to a box or folder that the director can use um, as a feed when he or she wishes to show a live replay of that specific point. So it might be easier to explain the free play operator's job with like a live demonstration of it. So we'll have to do some role playing right now. Uh, imagine we are at the non-tournament and I'm the free play operator. Um, and what I have on the screen now is um, just a match from the non-tournament. I think it's Willstrop versus Patrick Rooney. I think it's like round two or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you what it's like as a free play operator during a match and go through the process of what we do. Um, so this isn't what you'd see on the um, free play display, this is just like an editing, uh, editing app called Adobe Premiere Pro that we use to um, cut our uh, matches and export them to Squash TV and uh, the Squash TV YouTube channel. So. What you would normally see is like um, something like this where you just have a screen of the match at multiple different angles. Um, so let's imagine we are at the non-tournament and pretend we're doing the free play. So I'm waiting at this point. Still waiting. And at this point, I will um, press the output button. So once this is pressed, there is a four second offset delay from when you press it. So it will actually start recording, not when I pressed the output button, but from uh, at this point here. So it'll give me a little bit of a rally, then it'll give me the winning shot. The reason why the free play machine does that is because it, it's important to get the build up of the point. Um, also, I can't predict the future, so the free play machine knows that. And so it gives me some time before the shot has been played so that I can show the full context of the shot. Otherwise, you would be seeing the replay from this point onwards and obviously that doesn't make sense because not only do you not see the shot you don't see the build-up of the shot so the free play machine gives me that four second um, delay or gives me that four second I should say increase of, of time so once that's done I then export that clip that short four second clip that the output button gave me um, to a file on the free play display and what happens here is that with the clip 
the free play machine gives me all the different camera angles of the same shot. So what we usually do is, if this um, live shot, for instance, was shot with the back camera, so what we'll normally do is use a different camera angle for a, for a live replay, um, because otherwise you're getting the same shot twice and you're not really getting any more kind of visual experience from, from the match. And also you have to think about the context of the shot. So this shot, the winner was in the front left corner. So as a free play operator, I would pick the front left camera angle because it will obviously show the best shot or best angle of the shot. So let's see if the operator did that. Yes, they did. So yeah, what you have is you have like camera one, two, three, four, and let's say camera one is like the front right corner, camera, le camera two is the front left, camera three is over the head, and camera four is the back corner, back one, basically. Um, uh, it's not necessarily one is left, two is right, it, it will change from tournament to tournament, but that's just an example of it. But basically you'll pick the best camera angle of the shot and also one that's different from the live broadcast. So once that's chosen, the director will go um, replay, I will go yep, the director will go roll, and at that point you'll double click on the camera angle that you want, and the director will then fade into the um, shot, that's quite funny there, uh, fade into the shot with a graphic change. Um, so that's basically how it's all done, and then they will exit that live replay with the same graphic change. Um, once you do that and the director is happy with the free play, you then have the option to take that clip and put it in the highlights timeline in the box below. Um, this is important because at the end of the game you have the highlights to show the kind of summary of the game. Um, so you've got to make sure you have at least, let's say, five or six clips in that highlights timeline. Um, because it gives the commentator something to talk about at the end of each game. Um, so I think I got an example of that. So, yep, so this is the end of the game. Oh, I've gone too far. So, yep, we'll then change into the highlights with the same graphics. And here, these are all the highlights I have chosen or the operator has chosen from the match put it into the timeline and then you just do a simple fade in between each cut. So that's pretty much the entire process of the free play operator. It's important for the last cut um, to be a little bit extended. So instead of four to five seconds, it'll be like 10 seconds. This one, I think. Yeah, so you can see the player walking out of the court and it gives the commentators more time to finish their conversation because the director has got like, he's got a certain amount of clips and he's gonna be like, right, five to go, four to go, three to go, two to go, one to go. So that the commentators know when to stop talking and then we can just have our break and you guys can have your break. So that's the entire process or role, I should say, of the free play operator. And good Lord, am I tired. Oh, that explanation was so long. Oh. Mm. Not used to speaking that long and concentrating that long, really. God help me. Um, in fact, right now, I'm going to go to the toilet because, man, that was a lot of effort and concentration. Don't go anywhere. I'll be back. Oh, God, that toilet was needed. Man, I feel so much more refreshed. Oh, feel a lot better. Um, one thing I did forget to mention about the free play machine was what the fader did, or the lever, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the uh, fader in the what's it? Um, Vision mixer desk was used for transition purposes, whereas the fader in the free play machine is used to slow down the footage 
Um, this is mainly used for when there's like a winning shot or a nick, usually to dramatise the shot or make it look more special. Um, it also can be used for um, referee decision, so like if a ball thinks, if a player thinks it's double bounce, then we will use the lever and then the uh, swivel ball device to uh, get the point of contact or as close as we can to determine whether the ball hit, a gr hit the ground or not. Um, the lever can be used for stuff like that. And it's useful for those things and it, it's, it's a useful tool for dramatising the broadcast as well as helping out with the referees and their decisions. Anyway, after another successful day of broadcasting, we celebrated by going to another bar near the Opera Theatre. Um, now this bar didn't have a live band unfortunately, but that doesn't mean the music wasn't just as funky. And this place had quite a uh, edgy vibe to it, shall we say. And the drinks there were actually really nice. And there was a lot of cool memorabilia scattered around the bar. And it made it, or it gave it at least, quite an old school vibe. And I really liked that. Um, and there was a picture behind us with just this random person on there. And one of the um, crew members looked at me and was like, oh, Tom, do you know who that picture's of? I then looked at him, looked at the picture, and was like, hmm. Nah, sorry mate, I don't know who that is really. And he looked quite shocked. So he then turned to the other crew members and he was just like, oh, you guys know who that is, don't you? The other crew members then looked at the picture and were like, of course I know who that is, you know? I'm not stupid. And I'm thinking, well, who the devil is this bloke then? You know, but why is he, why is he in the mugshot? and why is he so famous? So the crew were all looking at me, eagerly awaiting an answer. And I looked back at the picture and I just, you know, I was just like, look lads, I have no idea who this guy is. I am sorry. Um, they eventually told me his name was Frank Sinatra. And then I was like, oh, okay, Frank, I, I can see it now, I've got you. Still have no idea who Frank was, but I wanted to save myself from further embarrassment. So I was like, yes, I know Frank. He definitely looks like Frank to me. Uh, so eventually, you know, like we had a few more drinks after and then suddenly we got back into the conversation and uh, one of the crew members was like, oh, so who was Frank then, Tom? Do you, do, what's your favorite thing about him? And I was like, oh, Frankie? Oh, well, I like, um, you know, he's a, uh, you know, I like his what, yeah, he, uh, I was sweating at this point. And then they just looked at me and was like, you have no idea who he is, do you? I had to admit defeat at this point because I was getting more and more dazed from the beer. I was pretty knackered from the day. So I was like, okay, I can't do anymore. I have no idea who this guy is. My attention span was decreasing exponentially as it was. Um, so after that, we called that bar Frankie's because it was an easy name to remember. And because of that experience, it was an easy place to remember where it was. So we just ended up calling it Frankie's. Um, but we had a great time there, and it was a good way to end the day. So day three is upon us and due to tournament scheduling, James, who was the free play operator during the first few rounds of NON, had to go to China for the women's teams events, I think. Um, this meant I had to do the free play operating for some of the quarterfinals and all of the semi-finals and finals unsupervised. So no pressure then, obviously. Um, and luckily, however, I was able to get some practice with James in the earlier rounds before he left. 
So I was feeling mildly confident about being the operator, but either way, I was excited to learn from the experience. First match of this quarter-final stage here, Lucy Tamel of England taking on Nadine Shahin of Egypt, the number three seed. George Parker, he'll take on Zahed Salem, also of Egypt. There's a lot of English interest going on. Emily Whitlock plays Julianne Cortese. And then Jay Zolstrop in the late shift, he'll be taking on Luca Sir, the number five seed from France. The Women's Open, which is coached by somebody we know pretty well, Amara Abdelaziz. Use it to your advantage and taking a quick drop shot like that. What a wonderful finish. Well, it's a, <coughs> it's a bread and butter, really, the back end. Yeah. She's playing beautifully, she's really well balanced. That's the second one she's put in. This was a better one, wasn't it? Chance again here. He's guessed it. Oh, that was a roar worthy of the halt from Zahed Mohammed. So to my surprise, that actually went pretty well. There were a few parts that obviously did muck up a little bit. But I mean you can't get better at what you do or learn from the experience until you go through certain failures. Then you're able to develop on what you have and progress to the next level. So I felt it was a pretty successful day. That's a great shot from Gillis. Terrific. Nicely set for her, but uh, finished it off nicely. Yeah, no. It's a shot of the match so far from Gillis. Nice. Well, from either player. So after this, we celebrated my first day of free play operating with a few drinks at Frankie's again. As you can probably tell by now, there's a definite trend of the staff and how they spend their evenings. Uh, and this time at Frankie's, they had the dance lights on, which made things a little more interesting. I mean, the room wasn't that big, so we didn't get down and get too crazy in the dance floor, but we also had fun anyway. But we couldn't have too much fun, however, because we needed to be sharp and be ready for broadcasting the finals the next day. So we had to kind of leave a little bit earlier to be ready for that. Before leaving, however, we did get a few more drinks in there, just to help us get to sleep that night, obviously, so we could be ready for the big day tomorrow. Please give a massive hand for Naila Gillis. Please welcome Emily Whitlock. Yeah. Eleven four. Then to Whitlock. Whitlock leads one game. Oh, she's got her again. Got her again. Three times. Sensation of stuff, Joey. Oh, oh wow. Lady oh, Guinness has done it. That's <laughs> already deserved as well. Henry Whitlock's left everything on the court there physically. Touch again, Rebecca James, nice follow up as well. First opportunity to get a win over James Wallstrom. Oh, it looks like it's. Oh, 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 he's jumped in the hospital pass. That is the huge hospital pass. Ruthless Ralph has bottled it. Oh, it's a no let. It's a no let. It's oh, a sad way to finish. It's a really sad way to finish, but there's. Gentlemen, Jim. Big Lamb James! Yeah. 
And that's it, the tournament had now officially finished and I was absolutely knackered. Uh, now, however, was the funnest part of going to any event, de-rigging all the cables and packing up all the broadcasting equipment. So this is pretty much the same process as rigging up, but obviously in reverse. So taking the cables from the stands and bringing them down, coiling them up and putting them away in the boxes neatly. So that pretty much concludes the event and documentary. I hope you guys have enjoyed watching it. So if you like what you see and you want to see more behind the scenes footage, then go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. Um, you can also comment below about how you think I could improve the documentary if I were to do it again in the future. Um, apart from that, thank you very much for watching it. And to keep up to date with all squash related content and news, go ahead and subscribe to the Squash TV YouTube channel. I hope to see you all again soon. Have a great rest of the day and take care.